public, go live, preparing to stream. Oh, it says meeting is now streaming live on YouTube. Oh, okay, on cool. Awesome. Do you want to just um, – here, I'm going to tweet out at you. Um, All right. And then uh, just maybe retweet it. That'll be good. Yeah. Uh, let's tweet. Uh, uh, that, that, that. Uh, good. All right, so I just tweeted at you. Yeah, I got it. I got it. Okay, cool. So retweet that. We'll see if it works. I'm going to check my profile here. Let's see if I see it live on YouTube. Um, cancel that live now. Yeah, it looks like we're live. Uh, All right. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so give that a thumbs up. Well, uh, Chris, it's been a long time. <laughs> I haven't seen you in, in person in what two decades, but uh, remember Something very like that, yeah. uh, remember very fondly uh, interacting with you in uh, oh, was it Professor Bob? Oh, what was Professor Bob at uh, uh, Matthew? Bob Matthew. Oh yes, I love Bob. Uh, fantastic guy. We were in the class. Uh, I think you were an undergrad. Wait, you were an undergraduate. Or are you a graduate student back then? Uh, no, I was I was a graduate student. You're a graduate yeah. student. Who was your advisor? Was it? I just look very young. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Still do. I worked with uh, Jay Gallagher and also Matt Bershady, if you remember those guys. Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, so it's great to see you face to face, have a conversation with you, and uh, definitely, yeah. hopefully, some folks out on uh, online on YouTube. It's uh, it's been you know I followed your career and and of course uh, you know at, at one point uh, we were we were communicating locally because we were in California together you were at Caltech as well um, That's right. <clears throat> around the same time uh, that I was there or maybe when I was starting here and I, I think I think we had you down here at one point maybe uh, when the Burbages were were still I alive I uh, I interviewed for a faculty job at UC San Diego but unfortunately uh -huh. did not. We well, fortunately, or unf <laughs> unfortunately for us, we'll say it like that. Yes. Uh, well, we have great respect for you. And and tell us uh, a little quick bio of uh, where you are now in the UK and um, and then what roles you uh, perform there. And uh, are you still editor of AppJ as you as you were? What's your uh, current you know world line look like? Yep. So I am currently a professor of astrophysics at the University of Nottingham. I've been here since 2005. And uh, my main research is not on aliens or SETI or any of this <laughs> stuff. This is um, what we're going to talk about is a side project for me, which kind of um, um, became a big, a big story. But uh, my main interest is galaxies and galaxy evolution. And that's mostly what I've done throughout my career is look at how galaxies change with time, did a lot with and do a lot with the Hubble Space Telescope and I've got lots of plans for James Webb. Uh, and I'm also uh, the, the uh, lead editor for Galaxies and Cosmology and the AAS journals, which, which includes the Astrophysical Journal. Aha, uh -huh. great. And, um, and you have, as you said, you are not necessarily, uh, you know, this is not your day job typically to look at these problems. And, no. uh, and it's, not, uh, it's not kind of irrelevant to this time that we're living in. Uh, I always say, you know, my show is completely apolitical. I don't talk about, you know, Republican constellations or, you know, Democratic asteroids or whatever. Uh, but this result has generated so much intensity. I think I'm going to break the, the political, uh, forbidding political discussion. And uh, we're going to get Go into the details of your new paper. Um, no, I'm just joking. It's 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 generated no, a I'm, lot of controversy, as you know, and I think it's uh, yeah, think it's fine. That's good. That's good. And and, and some really fun headlines. Uh, yes. As well, <laughs> such as uh, I'm going to choose one in the background. Let's see if this will work. Replace my background with a with a picture of you. Uh, let's see if this works. And I have no idea what this says, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, it's got to be galaxy uh, something about something 30. thirty something galaxies. Um, yeah, I think it's Turkish. Yes. 
Yeah, Actually, I, I did translate it, but I forgot what it said now. It was nothing oh, okay. bad. Thank well, God. If my friend LK or <laughs> Tanair are listening, can you guys please translate this? <laughs> so uh, we're going to talk about this. Uh, we're going to talk about the, uh, the actual uh, results in the paper and the details that went into it. And kind of uh, let's first start off uh, because people I think might be interested. You said it's not what you do. You're normally a, you know, a yeah. classical optical astronomer, which means that you look through telescopes, as I understand it. That's right. Um, yeah. No, but you, uh, you, you don't look through them, but you use them. So tell us what, what, you norm what your main research focus is, first of all. My main research focus is understanding how galaxies form. So uh, this goes all the way back to the beginning of where we can see galaxies, redshifts uh, around redshift six, seven, maybe eight. Um, perhaps nine sometimes, depending on whether or not you believe sources you can find. And that's basically when the universe was 500 million years old and then since then. And so I look at how galaxies have changed, but in an empirical way. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of models out there that predict how galaxies form. But what I do is actually look at the galaxies and determine how they change. So these features are like their masses, their star formation rates, how much merging they have with other galaxies is something I've done a lot in my career is look at galaxy mergers and how they've evolved through time. Sizes is another big one I've done a lot of work with and morphology, just how they look. So mm -hmm. when you put all this together and you can trace how they change through time for galaxies of different say stellar masses or galaxies which you can trace hopefully as the same type of galaxies using like a number density selection, which basically means you just take the most massive fraction to some density limit and you assume that those galaxies are at least statistically similar through mm -hmm. time then you can see how they grow how their morphologies changes how, how how mergers are affecting their evolution and if if you like i haven't done much on this but you could look at how agn are changing active galactic nuclei how maybe their black holes have evolved with their galaxies so it's a combination of that process and that's basically what i've been doing last 20 years or so is looking at those questions. Mm -hmm. So is it safe to say this recent paper is your lowest redshift result uh, that you've ever worked on? <laughs> you know what? That's a good question. I hadn't thought of that. Probably, yes. You have done is. any uh, planetary yes. astronomy recently? Because uh, be No, I have never <laughs> done a paper on, um, on anything planetary, no. So this must be the nearest stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's been a lot of uh, interest in this paper. I put a link in the show notes, or not in the show notes, I will someday put it in the show notes, but this paper, and you have a wonderful Twitter thread online about it. Of course, it's not yeah. without its controversy. I asked you if you if you had a chance to put together a, a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, do you have any slides uh, that you can show us? And, I, I, made, us I made a, um, awesome. I made a very short one. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm going to uh, give you hosting permission. Um, all right, cool. So I'm going to go host Professor Consolese. I see you. Um, and people are asking if this is live. How do we prove it's live without saying a, a word that's banned? On TV? Um, well, it's 632 in the, sorry, 1632 in the UK. So and 832, hard, 833 in to, California. Hard to make that up. You know. <laughs> All right. You are now driving the, the PowerPoint right, bus, cool. my friend. Let's do it. Hey, Rati. Let's see here. You see this? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Okay. Let me start this. Okay, so uh, I just have a couple slides, and then we can talk about talk about things. So this is the paper, and it came out uh, in the journal Astrophysical Journal about um, a couple of days ago, about about uh, around the fifteenth of, of June, and uh, the title is "The Astrophysical Copernican Weak and Strong Limits for Intelligent Life." Okay, and I won't go read the whole abstract, but basically what we do is we essentially ask the question: How many intelligent communicating civilizations might there be in our galaxy based on just some very simple assumptions and using recent data about cosmology and about planets that, that only appeared in the last say, well for planets the last decade with Kepler mission, but for st star formation rate of our galaxy, which is the last few decades. So a lot of this stuff is based on, on actual measurements of astrophysics. Another one is the metallicities of stars in our galaxy, something which has also been realized and measured recently through surveys looking at the spectra of stars throughout our galaxy. So that's something else that's, that's new here. And I'll come back to that in a second. 
So let's you, start uh, off sorry, with Chris. Can you uh, can you just say a few words about your co-author? Is that a student? Oh or... yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, yes, thank you. So Tom Westby is a um, he is a staff member in the uh, mathematics department at the University of Nottingham, and um, he is a is a young guy. He's younger than me. So he must be young, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> well, to a cosmologist, everybody looks young. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, so Tom, Tom is is a uh, staff member, and he does uh, some teaching in in maths. Uh, but he uh, he doesn't have a, a PhD, at least he doesn't yet. And uh, he wanted to do a project, so he actually uh, audited my galaxies class. Mm -hmm. a couple of years ago and uh, he came up to me and he says I would like to do a master's on something uh, like a terminal master so he's not necessarily interested in doing the typical you know do a PhD try to find a postdoc he's got a job already and he just wanted to do a master's uh, to get his feet wet doing some astrophysics and I've always wanted to do this project this is something that I kind of always wanted uh, to look into I've been thinking about it for a long time and uh, now that I have a secure position, at least I think I do, <laughs> and that Tom himself is not going to be on the, uh, you know, the astronomy job market, you know, why not do this, this study, which of course, um, some people won't like, mm -hmm. which we already knew. And uh, so that, that's how that happens. So Tom is not a typical uh, PhD student. He is ah. a uh, terminal master's. Mm -hmm. So that's Tom, and okay. I'm sure Tom will see this uh, soon. And thank you very, very much, Tom, because he did the uh, the bulk of the real work in this paper for sure. And then the last thing uh, before we move to the next slide is uh, what is yeah. the Copernican principle? Can you explain that to the audience who may not be familiar with it, uh, and how it applies, uh, you know, more widely in uh, in astronomy and the history of astronomy? That's a big part of this, uh, I think. Yeah, definitely. So <clears throat> when uh, when when scientists first started asking questions about the universe, say the ancient Greeks, Aristotle in particular, who came up with the, basically the, uh, the model of the way we think about science for 2000 years or so. The idea was, and this was never really questioned, is that the earth is at the center of the universe and everything revolves around it, right? So you have the sun, the moon, the planets, the stars, all moving around uh, in the crystalline spheres around, around the earth. And um, that wasn't that really wasn't changed until Copernicus. Okay, and so Copernicus came up with the idea. Uh, most people will know this: that actually the sun is the center of the solar system, and that the Earth goes around the sun. Okay, and uh, uh, at that time, of course, um, they didn't make the, the big conclusion that there was a galaxy and you know, a cosmology and all this. They they just assumed the sun was the center of the universe, right? And then it progressively became less and less important in terms of where we are in our galaxy, in terms of where we are in the universe. And so we're taking the next step and saying that, that essentially we're not special in the sense that our formation as a intelligent species on this planet isn't special, but that in fact is just a natural part of the scientific process. Okay, so that's basically the idea. And the weak and the strong limits are having to do with how that life forms. So. Yeah. On other planets. So the strong limits are that it forms exactly the same way as it did on Earth, the same amount of time, the same metallicity that we have on, on our planet. And the weak limits is where you relax that condition of time and where you need just the amount of time that we did form, which is about four and a half billion years, but can happen anytime after that. It doesn't have to happen at that time. So the strong mm -hmm. is it happens at about five billion years, but the weak is that it just needs four and a half to five billion years but anytime after that it can it can form it can happen like at nine billion years uh -huh. so you just need at least that amount of time so that's the weak aspect of it and of course you'll find more of these uh proposed civilizations in the weak criteria than you do in the strong yeah and just for my audience out there we've done a lot of uh, talks over the last uh six to nine months that revolve around either seti uh in this case uh, keti I believe is how you'd pronounce it. And uh, and also we've looked at the question of origin of life. We've had guests on from Scripps Research Institute, uh, origin of life, the role that chirality plays in life and acute connection to none other than Primo Levo, Primo Levo, Levi, Levy. Um, yeah. 
And uh, we had a nice discussion about that. And I, and earlier this year, we had on Paul Davies and uh, Jim Benford and others discussing, um, you know, 60 years of the Drake equation, almost 60 years of, of at least searching for extraterrestrial intelligence, Eddie, and, uh, and the kind of eerie silence as Paul Davies uh, describes it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, let's go to your next slide, which I believe involves the Drake equation. The, the yeah. So, equation. so this is the, uh, the famous Drake equation, which um, a lot of people really hate and I'm not a big fan of it either. And let me explain why. <laughs> so the Drake equation essentially is uh does the same kind of thing that we did, but it looks at things a little bit differently. And one of the things it does is it has the, this, uh, here's the equation right here. This uh, N is a number of civilizations and you have all these terms. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I'll put up, point out a few of them. R is the um, average star formation rate in the galaxy. So that we don't use, but the ones that are really kind of, let's say, I don't know the right word for it, but an annoying is probably one or <laughs> frustrating with the Drake equation is it has these terms, the fraction of those planets of planets that are around a star uh, that can develop life at some point, fraction that develop intelligent life, fraction of intelligent life uh, that, that releases signals. And these three terms here are really impossible to know mm -hmm. unless you actually detect life. So the Drake equation cannot be used really as something predictive because those numbers can range from zero to, to one. And if, you know, people and, who and look at this know that. And as I, I gave a talk, I was honored to give a talk once at the SETI Institute where the, you know, Frank Drake is the, uh, basically the, uh, you know, the, the most high priest of, of that and, and Jill Tarter is, uh, is worthy, uh, is worthy equal. And uh, I went over the Drake equation. I said, uh, and maybe Chris, tell me if you agree, if one of your students handed in an equation and it just had these numbers and nothing else. And I think this is the big thing that's missing from all the popular media accounts of, of your paper that causes a lot of the controversy. What grade, what mark, what do you call it in England? Marks, you call it? Uh, mark, yeah. Yeah, so what kind of mark would he or she get if, if this is exactly the equation that they turned in with no, nothing else associated with it? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. You never hear the uncertainty bar. You never hear this equation basically can have, you know, 100% uncertainty uh, in it. Now, we've, we've actually reduced dramatically um, the uncertainty on some of these parameters. And your actual day job yeah. research is, is responsible for part this, you know, the first term, R so star, right? R star is a cosmologist quantity, let's call it. And then F of P also, we, 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 um, we didn't know that say 20 years ago, but we know this now from Kepler. Yeah. So we know a couple of these things that we didn't know, certainly didn't know 60 years ago with when Frank uh, Drake first proposed this equation. So we do know some of the terms, but as I said, some of them we will never know until we actually detect life and then have a statistical sample of, of planets that we know don't have life and ones that we do. And then we can measure these terms. So they, they are terms that are in principle real, but there's no way of knowing it until you actually detect life. Right. So that's the problem with the Drake equation. I think Great. you would agree, right? <laughs> yes, I, I do agree. And, and I always you know, like to point out the uncertainties, which you do a very careful, I mean, I think the bulk of the paper is the error analysis, which hopefully we'll get into in the next couple of slides. So yeah, let's, let's go to the next one. Yeah. All right, cool. So <clears throat> This is our new Shetty equation. And um, essentially what we do is make that assumption that I already discussed, this uh, astrobiological Copernican principle where it takes at least 5 billion years or so for life to form, okay? And then so we have a different equation where from the star formation rate history, we know what this N star in this equation is. So this is the N is the number of civilizations that are actively uh, sending out signals into space. N star is the number of stars within the galaxy, which actually is part of the biggest part, some of the biggest part of the uncertainties in this is that number. That's something that I was quite surprised looking into this is that was, isn't something that we know um, very well mm. is mm -hmm. the number of stars in our, in our own galaxy. There's still quite a bit of uncertainty about that. But anyway, yeah. we can talk about that if you want, but it's uh, just something to do with the dust in the galaxy. It makes it hard to see things. Very familiar then with dust and the problems it causes. <laughs> yeah, dust is a big deal. <laughs> yeah, you know well too, right? <laughs> F of L is the fraction of the stars which are older than five gig years. So this is uh, certainly a different term than anything you have in Drake. So this says uh, what what fraction of the stars 
are older than five giga years. And that's something that we wouldn't have been able to calculate even you know, 20 years ago. But because we know a lot about the history of the star formation in our galaxy and other galaxies, we know how old the stars are within, within galaxies, statistically at least. We don't know exactly every star's age, <clears throat> but we know the star formation history, so we get some idea of, of how, how many are older than five giga years. Yep. Okay. And then F of HZ or H, HZ, if you're in America, which is the fraction of those stars which have a basically a planet in the habitable zone. And that's something that um, we recently realized or calculated from the Kepler mission. So that's a big part of this is knowing that value. Yep. That is something that we didn't know um, at all until, until maybe five years ago, even, uh, even kind of a good hint. Okay, let me go on. So F of M is the fraction of stars which host a metal rich planet. Metal rich is defined in many different ways. So if you want a, a star like our sun, then it would have to be solar metallicity, obviously, which is actually quite rare in our own galaxy. Maybe only 10, 15% of stars are that metal rich at most. Uh, but you can use other metallicities too. And we actually do that in the paper. We go into to some depth about looking at the distribution of metallicities and assuming different metallicities um, um, for that fraction. And then the other thing which is different is this thing tau, which is the average amount of time in which life could have formed on that star. So that is basically going to be the, the age of the star minus five giga years. And so that tells you how long has a, how long, how much time has elapsed on that planet since the potential formation of life, which we assume has to happen within five giga years, or sorry, after five giga years. And so that that's basically the amount of time you have or you've had have to form life if you need five giga years to form life. And then L is similar to the Drake equation is the average lifetime of a advanced civilization. And this is the one, this is probably the most interesting aspect of all of this is mm -hmm. that, 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 um, that quantity L mm -hmm. is the average lifetime of a civilization, which is uh, uh, able to transmit signals essentially that we could detect. Yep. And that could be anything that can be in principle like radio waves. Um, it could be, you know, lasers. Some people are going to look for lasers with SETI now. It could be things like even things like um, say light from cities or something like that, which in principle you could detect if you had the right technology, let's mm -hmm. say. So that's basically it. And so uh, nothing in here, Chris, has to deal with the probability for life to form. And then once life forms, then it has to become not only sentient, conscious, like a dolphin, but it has to have no. uh, technology. So that's that's all subsumed in the assumption that the lifetime is predicated on the existence of a technologically capable civilization. Is that right? That's right. So it makes the assumption here, which is that this is this is one of the key things about this, is that if you have a planet in a habitable zone, which is metal rich enough, and you give it enough time on say a stable star, then it will form intelligent life. Mm -hmm. That's a big assumption. I, I, I totally accept and admit that it's a big assumption. Mm -hmm. Now, and you can, you can say, well, that's probably not true. And it probably isn't true, right? Mm -hmm. To some extent that probably isn't true, but I would say you have to start somewhere. You have to ask these questions somewhere. Mm -hmm. You have to start, by solving this kind of equation, if you want to call it like a Drake-like equation, if you if you want, that's fine. But if you want to start asking how many of these civilizations could we have in our galaxy, you have to start somewhere. So this is really the first attempt to do this by by saying that if you have the right conditions, you form life. Yes. And you form intelligent life. Got it. And we could be rare. We could be the only the only civilization in our galaxy. And, and in fact, before I started this, I thought that was the case. And, and, and um, I, I was actually thinking that I would find that when you did this calculation that you would get one or two or something very small, plus or minus a huge number. And therefore, hey, well, the, you know, it's, it's unlikely that, or it's, it's unlikely that there are other civilizations in our galaxy, because look at this number when you assume that all, all, pl all planets that could host life, um, do you still only find a couple, right? That's what I was thinking I would find. But we got we got something which is bigger than that. It's, it's not a much bigger, but it's still a few dozen in terms of the principal result. It has an error bar on it, which goes down to, to a few, uh, goes down to two, essentially, with, with the error bar. So we could still be the only 
only civilization. But the key aspect of this is not that we were trying to say there are 36 civilizations in our galaxy, because it's not what we're saying, but we're saying yeah. if you make this assumption, this is what you get. And if you think that that life is uh, uh, different from say, and you know, it could very well be, right? If life forms in a different way than say a, uh, how a planet forms, how a galaxy forms, how a star forms, but right, if you have the right conditions for forming those things, you form them, right? If you have yeah. enough if you have the right gas, temperature, density, you form it, right? Life oh. mm -hmm. yeah, go could on. be different. Mm -hmm. It probably is different to some extent, but if you take a, just a hard scientific approach to it, that, that the formation of life and the formation of intelligent life is somewhat inevitable given the right conditions, just like everything else in science, then this is what you get. Mm -hmm. So that's really kind of what we're saying here. So, uh, so getting some questions in the comment section about uh, whether or not this metal rich um, attribute is the, you know, is, is kind of a requirement. Uh, could you have a, you know, is, well, first of all, explain what a metal is to a non-astronomer oh, yeah. <laughs> but second of all uh what is uh you know what, is that. jupiter does jupiter count as a as a metal rich planet i mean could you have uh not only a, a gas giant planet but what about a moon around a gas giant? you know do you have to go even further down the rabbit hole and calculate the moons that could possibly have high yeah. metal content as well so first of all what's a metal and second of all you know do moons count and gas giants etc yeah, okay, <clears throat> the metal thing. Uh, this is something that annoys me still. Um, so I'm so conditioned now to, to, to what a metal is in astronomy that I forget that other people, civilians, let's call them, don't actually <clears throat> know what I mean by a metal and what other astronomers mean by a metal. So a metal, of course, if you take chemistry in high school, a metal is like iron, you know, lead, right? Makes sense. But to an astronomer, uh, a metal is any element heavier than helium, okay? <laughs> And when I tell my students that in my galaxies class, they all laugh and, and uh, fair enough, right? Because that's not the definition that anyone else uses, but astronomers do use that. Right. So by metals, I mean things like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, things that you need to form life. Okay, so anything that, that is heavier than helium is a metal. So that's what I mean by a metal. So now to the, to the aspect of, um, Jupiter, Jupiter is not um, so wouldn't host um, wouldn't host life, but also it's it's uh, not in the habitable zone. Um, now, when you talk about moons, uh, it just says it's unstable, so hopefully it won't disconnect. We, moons, that's certainly it's a possibility, right? And there are moons in our own solar system that people are excited about. Uh, sorry, Chris, having a little trouble. This is can I... Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Do you yeah, hear? Can uh, you hear me? I, I, I it's intermittent. It's a know. little spotty. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Let's see. Let me see. Um, that my it's my home. Maybe uh, can you stop? Sh what happens if you stop sharing your video? Um, is it okay now? It's it's a little better, yeah. Maybe try. Can you try stop sharing your video? I don't know if that'll sh uh, cancel the screen share. I, I hope it doesn't. Let's try it. Oh, that was not good. That uh, kicked him off. I think he ended the stream instead of uh, just switching off his video. Let's see if we can get him back. There he is. Hello, Chris. Hello, I'm back. Is good. it better now? Uh, it's a little better. I was, uh, well, let, let's try it. Um, let's go back. The other thing I was saying is if you stop sharing your video, your live video, I think it'll still share the screen. Um, but let's, let's give that a try just so that we don't, um, tax the bandwidth. Over oh, there. you mean stop sharing my, own, my own video of myself. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. And then, uh, share the screen again. Yeah. Can you do that? Yeah. All right. Perfect. Yeah. It sounds a lot better now. Sorry about that, I have what's called Virgin Media, which is uh, a. Um, so I apologize for that. <laughs> okay, uh, where was I? Oh yeah, the moons, right? So, is it working okay now? Hello. Well, it's a little better. Yeah. It's. Can you hear me? Hello. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I could. I could tether on my phone if that if this stuff continues to be bad. So all right. So moons. Moons could indeed have. 
uh, a potential for life. Now, uh, about intelligent life, you know, we're getting into the realm of science fiction. So who really knows, right? But what we did in this, and this is really wanted to focus this just on things like us, things that formed sort of similar to us. You can always come up with, with different ways of forming life, which differ from us. And that could right. very well be the case too. But we really wanted to just start with this basic idea of looking at things which would resemble the way that we formed. So that's really uh, the point of this. Mm -hmm. I hope that got through. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's go to the next slide. All right. All right. So this just shows, and I'm not going to go into these in detail, some of the data. So the top one is the star formation rate uh, that we assume for our galaxy. So here you can do things like uh, integrate this to get ages of stars. And we did a lot of that, to figure out the ages of stars and how they're distributed with time. And then here you have a table which shows the um, occurrence rate of terrestrial sized planets within the habitable zone. And this is work from uh, uh, different studies listed there for FGK and also M stars. And this just shows this um, quantity for FGM, uh, how, where we derived it from these papers. So this, these are really the critical papers for this, for, for getting um, this fraction. And ultimately what we did by integrating essentially the values um, from these two different papers and looking at the distribution of stars, of course the M dwarfs will dominate number and we can come back and talk about that again as well, because it's a very interesting um, issue as well. The indoors dominate, but when you just do the correct integration, basically of multiplying the the, uh, the 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 fraction with the number of stars you're likely to see, then you get you get a, a value of 0 0.19, which is what we use in our study, and it has some uncertainty there, as you can see. The bottom one is the metallicity uh, distribution. Um, for stars that are greater than solar metallicity. So those are stars that have a metallicity. And remember, metallicity is, is anything heavier than helium. And it's, it's, it's a function of distance from the galactic center and also galactic scale height. And so yeah, was, put, yeah, that was a question I had. If it's not, yeah. uh, not all radii are equal in the galaxy, right? The galaxy is basically, uh, you know, yeah, a pancake right. plus a bulge. And so yeah. um, do you couple in galactic longitude with galactic latitude or is it just basically, you know, distance is distance? Because, you know. We, uh, we do both. So we have a big table on our paper uh, listing what these, these fractions are in different parts of the galaxy. Mm -hmm. And we know the, 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 the density distribution of stars. So we're able to put all that together, basically another integral, and therefore come up with the correct metally, metally, uh, distribution in terms of the number of stars at a given metallicity by taking into account the distribution of metallicity changes as a function of, of basically position in the galaxy. Mm -hmm. We do that. Great. Okay. The, uh, then finally, uh, I'm not going to. I, would, uh, I didn't want to show the math on this too much or the, or the plots, but if you look at the mean stars in our galaxy uh, year, then what you find is that this time of the ages of stars after about 5 billion years is about, is about 4.8 billion years. So the average age of a star in our galaxy is about 9.8 billion years. So if you subtract five from that, you get 4.8, which is how long in the weak criteria of the Copernican principle, after biological Copernican principle, how long you have had to form this intelligent communicating life is 4.8 billion years on average for, for, um, for a star in our galaxy. Um, should I move on or you have any questions? Oh, that's this? great. Yeah. We had that one, one person in the comments is saying, you know, Murphy's law must be scientific because uh, it's saying that, uh, and anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And a lot of these stars are hidden by dust on the other side of the cosmos uh, of the galaxy. <laughs> He's just making a joke. Um, yeah, yeah, that's very that's good. Very true. Yeah. It's, it's it devils us dust all. Dust is always, dust is always a problem. <laughs> that's right. I, I, there's a meme on, on the internet, you know, it's like when they do a trial and they say something causes cancer or cures it or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then the, the meme is, you know, just say in mice. And then I feel like saying, you know, for things like, a tabby star or whatever, you know, just say with dust you know, for astronomers. <laughs> but yeah, let's go on exactly. to the next one. All right, cool. So this is my final slide. I want to make sure this is my final slide. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if, if uh, people listening 
are really interested in this, I encourage them to look look at the paper. I think that uh, anyone with a scientific basic scientific background would understand this stuff. So there's a lot in here, but I will go through just a bit of it. So essentially we have this weak and then we have a, a moderate and strong criteria. And um, the, those are the criteria there. We have categories one through 12, where 12 is the, say the strongest, which is where the planet and life are forming on something which is exactly the same as on earth. And then on the right, you see the table, which has those categories again, uh, and then there's that 30, that famous 36 number in the bottom, um, the bottom left of that table, and, and essentially also gives us the mean, the maximum distance to the nearest neighbors, and you can see based on the criteria of different metallicities and different um, life life uh, times in terms of how long you might have formed a civilization. So again, the weak criteria here, four, five, and six. This is where the age is greater than anything greater than five gig years. So you're looking at anything greater than five, five gig years. Um, now I should say that these numbers are based on this is this is getting to that L thing uh, on the assumption that the average lifespan of an intelligent communicating civilization is 100, 100 years. So that's how long we basically have been communicating and uh, releasing radio waves into space, so to speak. Uh, for is about 100 years. So that is really a lower limit. Why so, is it, Yeah, yeah, exactly. So why is that? Um, I mean, what, what's on the other side of that is that, you know, we, we destroy our civilization or that we go to fiber optics, you know, we only use, you know, mass broadcasting of power for a long uh, for a short time, even out of the 100 years that we've been using it. And now we use fiber optics and we use beam form Gaussian beam transmission that's very directional. Yeah. Um, so we wouldn't really expect, you know, that if it's dominated by kind of just, you know, broadcasting in the literal sense of chucking everything as a, as a, you know, single point radiator, uh, it may, it may be an underestimate, right? I mean, we may actually be able to broadcast for a lot longer, uh, without actually having to assume that we kill ourselves after a hundred years or, uh, ho hopefully not. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So we we still have some signals going in space like radar and, and um things like uh sure. are still being transmitted indirectly into space you can argue mobile signals that kind of thing could also in principle go into space mm -hmm. so there's still stuff happening um the key thing about this is that this this is the limit based on how long we've been around, right? And how long we've been communicating uh, out into space, so to speak. So if you think of, and as a civilization, the average civilization, communicating civilization in our galaxy would be much longer than 100, which we hope it is, because we hope that we survive more than 100, then mm -hmm. these numbers would go up by that, by the, a proportional amount. Yeah. Okay. In this calculation, of course. And that's what so, scientists mean when they say a lower limit. It means it's likely not to be smaller than the value quoted. And, and yeah, it's in right. contradistinction to an upper limit, which is it can be no larger than, at least based on our evidence. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And one of the key things about this is that we talk about is that by looking for, we're doing SETI, by looking for um, civilizations transmitting and finding them, we would actually be able to say something perhaps about our own existence in the sense that if a intelligent species has the same characteristics throughout the galaxy, let's say, then the ability to make high technology and to transmit signals would certainly go along with the ability to, to destroy itself in, in many different ways. And I won't go through them all here, but you can imagine what some of those are. And if we find that there are many civilizations throughout the galaxy, I, I agree that's unlikely now, I think we would have seen something probably, then it would be a sign that this L value, how long that we, or how long an average communicating civilization lasts could be quite long. So the, the, the higher the density of civilizations, the, the better odds we have of, of being around for a much longer period of time. Mm -hmm. Now, alternatively, the other thing I want to point I want to make about this is that let's say uh, and sometime in the future, we have scanned the entire galaxy, we've seen every star, and we've determined that there absolutely is no intelligent life communicating on any of these stars throughout our entire galaxy. Well, I would argue that's, that's a very bad sign for our own existence, simply because uh, if, if, if things 
did develop, if, if uh, um, a communicating intelligence did develop, they're all gone now. And that means that mm -hmm. they have gone extinct. They've most likely destroyed themselves, or if you want, perhaps are destroyed by something um, astronomical, which is another possibility. But anyway, they haven't survived for very long. And that would, that would mean that we may not actually survive for very long either. So by looking out and trying to, to find these things, we're actually looking at our own future. But with the caveat that if we don't find anything, it also may mean, of course, that we are very unique and that our formation happened maybe in a random way or just got, we got very lucky, maybe. Or if you're religious, maybe you think that, you know, something to do with uh, God or, you know, something religious made us happen in, on, on planet Earth. So, that, you know, this has profound implications. So the point of this study is really to say if other civilizations could last for at least 100 years and they form the same way we do, how many would we find? Right. And so you'd find at least 36. You'd find on average 36, I should say at least. But you should find on average about 36 based on our calculation. So the point of this is that in the future, when people start asking these kind of questions, they can go back to this paper that we've written and use this sort of as a baseline for trying to understand more, maybe more complex questions. Or, and when we have more statistics from SETI, and that won't be for a long time, I, I understand, you know, we can compare what we're finding empirically with what you would expect just based on very simple assumptions. And if you find something different from this, then it tells you that something about your assumptions is wrong, which is very important because the assumptions that we're making are really critical for how life forms. And it's, it's could be very different. And so by comparing, we're effectively being able to learn something very profound about our own existence, both how we formed, how we evolved on earth, but also how long we might survive as a, an intelligent species, which is a very important thing. So yeah, I'm always reminded of the words of uh, John Muir, who's, we have a college, I'm actually in the John Muir College at UC San Diego. We have a college system, not unlike you guys do in the UK. Uh, but uh, he said, you know, by, by looking out and going out into the wilderness, I realized we were really going in and it's sort of possible to do a, a little self-exploration whenever we contemplate these big issues. These are really the ultimate issues and we don't spend that much time talking about it. And then when scientists do it very courageously and, uh, and so forth, as you and your colleague have done, um, you know, it sparks a lot of passion and, and interest. And uh, just in the last few minutes, I know it's late there and um, it's early here, but uh, uh, we, we, are you still there? Yeah, you're still there. Yeah, hi, I'm gonna put the video <clears> um, we have uh, we we have a, a deep interest in these in these questions, and we also like to talk about the the controversy, if you will. And you know, I think not, very few things in, engender controversy as much as thoughts of us being alone, completely alone, or not alone. I, I'd like to point out. I don't know if you read this book by Adam Frank, who's a professor in, in New York State here in, in the in the U.S. He has a book called Light of the Stars, where he Instead of using radio communication, he, he basically claims that um, greenhouse gas emission would be a, a, a sign signature of life. And he goes through and co comes up with a calculation with how many civilizations have existed, I believe, in all of cosmic history um, and, and all throughout the entire observable universe. And I believe if anybody's listening, I don't, I don't know, he's not a subscriber as far as I know, but... Uh, but in his book, uh, he I believe the number of civilizations in all of history throughout the observable universe is like 22 or something. I don't know if you read his book um, and there's no, some TED, TED Talks good. that he's given. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting book. But he also comes up with kind of a, a conclusion. Um, you know, first of all, the numbers are, I mean, it would if you just scaled from our galaxy to, to the observable universe, et cetera, you probably have 100 billion you know, uh, more factor more in the observable universe. And these are currently existing civilizations, Chris, in your model. These would be currently existing. Yes. Yes. Okay, so that, that's thing, another yeah. important thing is that these are currently existing that, that in principle um, we could detect. Of course, if something, the problem with this though, is that the, if there's really 36, let's say, then the average distance would be 17,000 light years. So if something there has existed, um, for 100 years, say, yeah. then we ne might not necessarily see the signal, right, if it's so right. far away. So by the time we did, they would be long gone. 
Right. And the messaging back and forth. And of course, there's controversy about that. I'm curious, what is your perspective on messaging to uh, extraterrestrial civilizations? Your your countryman, Stephen Hawking, warned against that, right? And it could be like inviting, uh, you know, inviting hungry, hungry people to dinner uh, where you're yeah. being served as the main course. I, I actually don't. I actually don't agree with that. I think that if if a civilization is able to contact us and to say come and come and come to us, that they would have mastered the way of having a high technology without without destroying themselves. That mm -hmm. they would have found a way to do that, and so you would think that they might actually be more reasonable than to just come into another place and just destroy everything. So I think that's a little um, unlikely. But who knows? It may. They may come down and eat us tonight. Who knows? <laughs> but that's my thought not. on it. And what is the closest uh, civilization? What's the um, the mean or the average distance to the civilizations? What's sort of like the most proximate one to us? If you do the <clears throat> if you do the uh, the strong Copernican limit, then the nearest one would be seventeen thousand light years. Mm -hmm. So yes, so that would Pretty be uh, quite a distance, uh, you know, quite a long time to wait for pen pal uh, mail to arrive. Uh, <laughs> so we have other people commenting, and uh, one of my undergraduates looked into this question, and he found an article. Um, I'm not going to promote it too much because I think the attacks were a little bit ad hominem, which I don't care for. Uh, but it was a rebuttal to the argument, and the author's case calls for an end of biological speculation by physicists and that, you know, oh, yeah. uh, but I think you made the case earlier. It really isn't predicated on the formation of life. That's why I asked that question. You know, I always uh, very respectfully will, will push back. Um, but I think, you know, that's really the key. And, and I guess, you know, I'm curious if you have to say right now, what, uh, what is the resolution of the Fermi paradox in your, in your opinion? Um, assuming this work is, and I think it's, it's reasonable. I, 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 well, I'll ask you first, let me ask you, what's the Fermi paradox resolution, the most likely one in your estimation? Well, I think the, 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 the Fermi paradox, which, um, for people who may not know, yeah. that is the question is why haven't we seen aliens if they, if they've, they've existed, the galaxy is, you know, 13.7 billion years old, 13. Point eight, maybe, uh, or so billion years old. <clears throat> so why haven't we seen them yet? And um, I, th I think the resolution has to be to some degree that uh, that the lifespan of civilizations isn't isn't super long, right? So if you've had that much time to form civilizations and for them to evolve, talking billions of years. I mean, the, the if you look at, uh, at when civilizations could have formed in our galaxy, the peak of them would have formed like five billion years ago. So mm -hmm. because of the way the star formation history of the galaxy is, right? We're very much latecomers in our galaxy's history, um, by definition to some extent. But still, if you look at the fraction of stars formed, uh, most of them were formed a long time ago. And therefore, and they had plenty of metals, so you could have formed, and you probably did form some life back then. Mm -hmm. So, and you could say, well why why um you know if if they if they they could go extinct for various reasons they destroy themselves and that's fine but if you have a uh, if you have a super high tech civilization i would expect that they would find a way to 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 colonize other stars or planets but also more interestingly and more likely probably is to form you know self replicating machines that can then colonize the galaxy mm -hmm. and over billions of years, you can do a lot of stuff. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, that's a lot of time. We can't really even imagine what that is as humans, how long that is. So that's, I think, is one version of it. Another version might just be that because the lifetime may not be very long, that actually any active ongoing civilizations are just very far away, like mm -hmm. in the calculation that we did. And therefore, very unlikely that they could travel here, very unlikely that we could detect them, and they wouldn't detect us because we've only been transmitting 100 years. So our our transmission bubble is only 100 years uh, in, in radius, right? So there's unlikely to be anything within 100 light years. So why, you know, why would we expect anyone to have seen us? Um, likewise yeah. for them, perhaps. 
So I want to close the conversation. Uh, this isn't our typical, I usually do what you know, are called Into the Impossible podcast. These are usually with authors of books, et cetera. Um, but at the end, uh, so the, the name of the uh, center here is the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. Uh, and we uh, typically, at the end of my conversations with authors, I ask them questions of, related to the, uh, the so-called three laws of Arthur C. Clarke, which is that, you know, first one, any sufficiently advanced civilization is indistinguishable from magic or technology is indistinguishable from magic. Um, to which my friend Michael Shermer on a podcast I did with him recently said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from aliens or any sufficiently <laughs> alien technology is indistinguishable from God. But uh, I, I, instead of going there, um, while we wait for your book to come out, hopefully, uh, <laughs> is, uh, is a question I ask uh, folks related to Arthur C. Clarke's 2001 A Space Odyssey turned into a movie by Stanley Kubrick featuring these famous monoliths. Yeah. These monoliths discovered on the plains and the savannas of Africa by early hominids and then later discovered on the surface of the moon. And I always like to ask my guests, uh, if you had a, a billion year long lasting time capsule, something that would convey a message, a warning, a hope or a future message to the future, what would uh, Professor Consolis leave uh, on his monolith? Oh, that's a good question. I have never really thought of that. What would I leave on my monolith? I don't know. I certainly would say something about that we were here once. Um, I know that's a lame answer, but uh, that's what comes to my mind. All right. Uh, assuming they could read it, you mean, I guess. Yeah, that's right. If you put it on a CD-ROM, it, it might not be so re readable. I had on uh, Andrurian, and her podcast will come out soon, and she actually did this. I mean, she had the, was responsible for the Voyager records and the, putting on uh, everything from, you know, her brainwaves and her heartbeat when she fell in love with Carl Sagan, all the way to putting on world music from Ghana and uh, all sorts of other places around the world. So uh, it was quite, uh, quite a lovely thing to actually talk to somebody who had actually done that, uh, sent something into space that I'll probably have that she claims as a four billion a year long uh, life uh, span. So uh, yeah, yeah. she may last to, you know, a star that's being born now uh, in the Consolese model may, by the time it's discovered, this Voyager record may have a, a life form that we can communicate with. Uh, Chris, what's next for you? Awesome. And where, where can people find you on the web uh, and uh, Twitter, et cetera? Yeah. So my, um, uh, on Twitter, my handle is just my last name, which is Consolese. Uh, and um, I, I don't have really a, um, a blog or anything like that. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, Twitter is basically where I, where I would post most things that uh, people might find of interest to me. Yeah. So what's next? So I, I, I'll be doing a lot more um, work on galaxies. I have certainly a lot of things coming out with that. Uh, I have many PhD students doing great work with, with that. So if you're interested in galaxies, uh, I do have a book on galaxies, which you can look up on Amazon, which is very very interesting about the history of galaxies. Oh, so there's right. nothing to do with aliens, though. <laughs> and um, uh, one, I, I do have a one little, one little SETI thing that I've worked on oh, with yeah. some undergraduates. So, um, again, um, and this might be the end of my, my, um, my dipping into this subject. We'll see. But I'm looking uh, for like galaxy-wide kind of um, alien archaeology. Um, ah, we did have a we did have a conversation with Greg. Uh, James Benford uh, about this this very subject. So lurkers in the solar. So I refer people to the conversation we had back in January uh, about this very topic. Actually, yeah, there's uh, there's some thoughts that there are these kind of Earth Earth trailing Earth orbit trailing Lagrange point uh, bodies that are big enough to support uh, maybe a monolith or something else, but some kind of archaeological <laughs> structure. So I'll put a link to your yeah. book in the in the chat I, I'll here. I have to watch that. I haven't seen it. Yeah. It's yeah. Pretty... Please do put the book in. Thank you. Yeah. But so I'm cool. I, I'm I'm interested in more large scale, like in other galaxies and stuff. And there's a there's, I think a good argument for thinking that the SETI might be found actually in external in an external galaxy before it's found in our own galaxy for various reasons. But maybe we can talk about that some other time. Uh, but but um, I had some undergrads look into this look and we didn't find anything. Spoiler alert. But okay. uh, we'll probably <laughs> we'll publish a paper short paper on it um, one day. Awesome. 
Well, that's great, Chris. I, I really appreciate you spending time with us. Congratulations on the fascinating result. Uh, time will tell. We're going to come back uh, for a redux of this in 17,000 years and uh, be able to <laughs> revise the limit upwards. And I, I just want to caution people out there. Uh, there's a lot of takes, and I know you felt uh, it was a little bit science journalism is unfair. And you had a great uh, you had a great quote. You know, like we need to teach how to use the latex you know plus minus symbol in all, yeah. all. and and right. I think you know that's uh, you that it is a service to provide that you have to always when you're out there listening and you're talking to lay people who are you know a lot of times science journalists are not experts in science that we really do want to associate what are the limits of our knowledge, not just our knowledge, but the limits yeah. of our knowledge. And I think you did a great job in, in that. I put a link to your your Thank discussion you. with Dr. Becky on that as well. Uh, oh, I, didn't, I don't think I've talked to her about this, but- uh, Oh, well, she was... had a link about uh, uh, this is- um, uh, That's um, my other result, which is on the earliest stars forming. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, I thought, okay. I misread it. Okay, good. But you do. Yeah. Okay. yeah so you yeah. have had that. People uh, should, people should look at that too. Cause that's, that's also very interesting. Yeah. And I'm going to put a link to my uh, talk at SETI where I go through the Drake equation and oh, cool. uh, hopefully people can check that out. I'd be interested to get your thoughts on that too. Uh, especially yeah. since it relates to, I do a calculation, not of alien occupation of earth, but of what is the current occupation? Well, this is four years ago. Now it's basically zero. Uh, but uh, what was the population of the San Diego Zoo? Because I believe the, the resolution of the Fermi paradox is the so-called zoo hypothesis. But we'll we'll have to take mm -hmm. talk about that. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm the logarithmic, uh, you know, uh, one over the, you know, ten thousand times uh, uh, knowledgeable as you are, Chris. I want to thank you so much. Uh, it's great to see you. Uh, you you, yeah, you are eternally uh, interesting, creative, and I thank you also for the oh, service thanks. that you do for astronomy. It's one of the highest impact journals in the world, highest, you know, certainly in astronomy, uh, the whole journal portfolio. And uh, someday I'd like to talk about, you know, journals, the history of the future of journals, the history of journals, peer sure. review, et cetera. So, uh, but again, congratulations. Thanks for staying up. Thanks and, very much. And uh, I wish you all, all the best. And thank you for inviting me. I had a good time. It was fun. Me too. Okay. Yep. Bye guys. Bye, Chris. Bye everyone.